first production first in Europe. This year the series is born out of following the opera actually. So it's the Mazenov of the series and of course it's a bit more conceptual or philosophical than anything about the interesting problems in that series. So the format we're going to do is in theatre of 20 minutes, which is a much more short and just understandable to a general Okay, <coughs> well, I guess you're using me as a guinea pig, and all of you who are here, you could be the next speaker, so keep that in mind. <laughs> if you ask too many questions, I'm sure you'll be here next. Uh, I'm willing to try anything once. Uh, I remember I once gave the first lecture in, I shouldn't waste my 20 minutes, but uh, <laughs> my, the first lecture in MSRI on how to lecture mathematics to the press. And my lecture is very famous, of, and it's on record, it's on tape, on, on how not to lecture to the press. They <laughs> use this as an example. So maybe this will be how not to give this, uh, how to kill conversation, I don't know. Anyway, the thing I want to discuss <laughs> is something that uh, I want to put in words, and here might be a place to do it, something I've thought about for a long time, and I'm sure others have too. And it's the following. I'm going to try to describe a principle. All principles, of course, will be false, but maybe we'll treat it as a working hypothesis. Maybe by half an hour, I will have withdrawn the statement completely. But it does seem accurate in number theory. It'll be interesting to see if it's accurate in other math fields. And that's the following statement, that if you have a problem, and we're all working on problems all the time, there's a dichotomy. It breaks into two kinds of problems. Either the problem is very structured. Maybe there's an exact formula which you're looking for. Maybe there's a group law. There's tremendous structure and the behavior is something is very regular, the behavior that you're looking for. And if that's not the case, then the complete opposite is true. That is, the answer is completely random and it's very hard to understand what the answer looks like, but it'll follow principles of randomness. So my plan is to give you examples of this. There are many of them in number theory, and you'll see they all follow the same pattern. <coughs> now, one thing that's interesting here is sometimes the, the randomness that emerges is not what you might have expected. It might not just be the obvious random thing. It could be quite subtle, and that can often be very indicative of what's going on, and you can learn a lot from it. In some problems, establishing this randomness is the entire story that is after a while, that's all you're interested in, as you will see in these examples. Just let me give one slide of the fact that this feature of randomness in arithmetic and number theory goes in two directions. So I already said this, that understanding the randomness is often the key issue. And once you understand it, perhaps you've understood the entire phenomenon. But <coughs> it's number theory has become the last frontier of applied math or the final frontier. It is extremely useful. And this kind of feature has been very popular at the Institute in the last 10 years or so, in the sense that the explicit, the fact that something in arithmetic, which is complicated, but is behaving randomly, but is entirely explicit, can be used in the reverse direction in a practical way. For example, to produce random numbers. Your computer produces random numbers by such arithmetic operations. They're called pseudo-random numbers. There are many structures that are constructed th through arithmetic which are efficient, optimal, cannot be improved on combinatorial structures. And they are there, they, the fact that they are behaving that way is because arithmetic is, mi is mimicking the random. And uh, Avi and his group, Russell, Avi and people like that, have de-randomization algorithms. You take algorithms that are probabilistic and they make them run essentially as fast uh, and remove the probabilistic side of things by using explicitness, which often comes from arithmetic. So I'm not interested in applications. I just want to describe five or six 
simple examples of, what, of this principle. The last example will end the principle. I'll show you that the principle is highly false in perhaps the most interesting case. <coughs> so, well, I added this just as I was writing these notes. I mean, I'm sure you've all wondered whether pi, I mean, you read this in the papers all the time, is pi a normal number? Are the digits of pi, pi is a very explicit arithmetic quantity, the most important number maybe in number theory, pi. It's known to be transcendental, but if you write it in any representation, continued fraction, or in terms of decimal expansion or ternary expansion, it looks very random. I don't even know e anybody who even thinks of trying to work on a problem like this. It's, it's obviously true, but how do you even tackle such a thing? I don't personally know anyone who's ever thought about this problem. Maybe you do. I'd be curious. So that's uh, something that the man on the street could wonder about something very concrete, all of a sudden it's behaving randomly. More clo closer to home, to things that many of us work on in number theory, is Diophantine equations. This principle has been pushed to its limit. I don't know if Enrico's here, but I think he's slowly saying he doesn't believe this, but in the literature it goes by the bombieri lang conjecture. This pushes this dichotomy to the ultimate limit. It says, that if you take a smooth projective variety, some set of equations in projective space with rational coefficients, and you try to find rational solutions to the equation, which is a very difficult problem, then the dichotomy is either you know how to produce the points because there are par parametric solutions, there are special sub-varieties which come from mappings of situations where you know how to create points, there are group laws, abelian varieties, there's maybe projective space, you can count how many points there are. The philosophy is there are some obvious ways to produce rational points, and if you don't see how to produce them, then there aren't any others. <laughs> so that's not saying there's randomness, but it's saying that the naivety conjecture is, we, we, we can't think more beyond what's naively the way to produce points. Uh, and it's, it will be true. I mean, the statement, the precise statement is all the points are of this type except for finitely many. The finitely many already, you could say, oh, that's beyond random. <coughs> Let me give you an example of really this randomness coming in immediately once you get rid of the structure with an example that's a Diophantine equation, which is old, which has many solutions. And it's one of my favorite problems. I usually use it as an example of everything because it's got all the juice in it. Let's write a number as a sum of three squares. So. Just which numbers can be written as a sum of three squares has been known for years. It's due to Gauss. But the number of ways you can write a number of sum of three squares is still not understood today. It's a very subtle function of n. It depends on class numbers of certain quadratic fields which mysteriously jump around. Very non-random. Well, some random in something, but nothing random of the type that I have in mind. So it's a regular function at some level, but not understood. It's about size square root n, ineffectively. So, let me repeat. We write n as a sum of three integer squares. So we're looking at a big sphere, radius square root n, and we look at all the integer points on the sphere. The number of points is subtle and structured. But where are the points? So this will be fit exactly into my philosophy. There's no formula for where I'm going to find the points. So once I can't find a formula for the points, they my dichotomy is they completely random. Is that true? Well, let's try to see. So let's, how are we going to measure it? Let's, there are many ways. You can look at different projections, piadic. This is just Archimedean. Let's just project them onto the unit sphere and see what they look like. So here's a picture written by, uh, drawn by Zev, who's working with uh, Zev Rudnik, who's working with Bergen and me on this. That's what these things look like if you take n to be the 10 to the 7th plus first prime and you do anything else, it looks the same with your eye. You can't tell the difference. There are many of them, as I told you, about square root n of them. That's, a, that's not random, but once you look at them and you project them and he looks at the little box to see what they look like, you can't tell the difference, at least with your eye, between a random set and the, in, and the actual points which are projected there. And every statistic we've tested these things look like they're absolutely random. So it's as if the number is subtle, but after that, God is just playing, throwing dots. He's just throwing these points. 
He's t you, he's t we know how many points he's supposed to throw. That's n. That's not a random variable. But once you know how many points, there's no other parameter in this problem as far as we can see. It's completely random. You can prove something towards this, but that's the kind of thing that one might aim for in trying to understand. And it's a simple example of this. It's the only dimension in which it's random. If you go to uh, sum of four squares, it's absolutely not random. There's structure. There are big holes. It's only in dimension three. Dimension two, if you take n and you write it as a sum of two squares, you can only do it in a few ways. Say n is prime, you can only do it in four ways. So there's no, there are not enough points to really say anything random. This transitional region immediately becomes random. Uh, I'm not talking about theorems here. This Obviously, I'm just talking. I mean, that was my understanding. This is some philosophy. Let me show you something much simpler, which is... In my view, the reason that a lot of things work in arithmetic geometry is let's just look at a finite field and let's look at something much simpler. So I take P, a large prime, and I look at the field with P elements. And let me look at the numbers when I order them going from 1 to P. So I advance linearly 1, 2, 3, up to P minus 1. This is when algebra says, well, wh wh why are you ordering that way? <laughs> this is, okay, I take 1. I had one, I had one. I think it's well defined. And now let's look at the inverses, how they come down. I claim that's completely random, and you can go check this at home in every test that you try. Well, it's not true that the first guy is random. One inverse is one. Two inverse is p minus one over two. It'll be in the middle. The next one will be p minus one over three if, it, if it's possible. Otherwise, it'll, you'll have to think a little bit. But the minute you go a little further, you won't know where it's supposed to be. The philosophy is once you don't know where it is, it's random. If there's no formula for it, if there's no easy description of it, it's random. So you could ask, how could we test such a thing? Well, I'll tell you an experiment that an uh, undergraduate student of mine did some years ago. I asked him to see, is this a random permutation? Well, it's not a random permutation. It's an involution. It's a, if I do it twice, I'll be back where I start. Does it look like a random involution on p minus 1 letters? And he checked the statistics. There are all sorts of things that people had discovered recently about random permutations along this increasing subsequence behaves like a uh, tracy widom distribution in random matrix theory. This followed it perfectly. A certain ensemble, quite a subtle answer. Of course, he couldn't prove anything. I mean, we can't prove things like that. Let me show you what we can prove and show you the kind of tool that goes to prove something which is measuring the randomness of just the inverses of numbers mod p. And I claim that that's why many things in arithmetic mimic random is because this operation is not predictable. So how could we measure that uh, these numbers are coming randomly when I put them down? Well, I put x here, and x bar, if it's going to be random, then that x and x bar shouldn't correlate with each other. This is e to the 2 pi i x over p. That's... Uh, well-defined, doesn't depend on the residue class mod p. And this is called the Klostermann sum. And if these numbers, if the x bars are coming down as if they were random, a moment's thought by just simple probabilistic reasoning will tell you this should cancel to about square root of the number of terms. Well, there are p minus 1 terms here, so you are quite happy to see when it's a theorem, and a very deep theorem, that s is at most 2 root p. It's a famous theorem of Vey, which he cheated about. It's due to Hasse. He wrote a paper in 1948 in the Proceedings of the National Academy, and he said he thinks this might be in the literature, but he's not sure. He knew exactly who wrote it. He didn't want to cite where it was, but people were asking him, how do you prove this? Of course, it used his proof of the Riemann hypothesis for curves over fi finite fields. Uh, it used Artin Schreier curves. Uh, he wrote this. Uh, if you look in 37, you will find a paper of Hasse which shows if you know the Riemann hypothesis, you could make this estimate. Okay, that's a history of that, but it's showing that these numbers are random in this order. That's a typical explication of this principle. And proving it here was a major achievement. Well, if that's a good example, then let's look at something that is unsolved. Look, at, this is a function that many of us have thought about quite hard. For each an integer n, you write it as a product of prime numbers to powers. If any of those powers appears to uh, 
degree bigger than one, so it's got a square factor, then mu of n, this is the Mobius function, is set to be zero. Otherwise, it's minus one to the number of prime factors. If I give you a large number n, which is square free, mankind doesn't, is it plus or minus one? Mankind doesn't even know if there's a fast algorithm to decide that. That's how little we know about this function. But if you look at it numerically or you do anything, it's certainly random at some level. It's not completely random because, of course, if four times a number, it'll be zero because I'll have four uh, a square factor. So if you actually want to measure the randomness of mu, it's quite a tricky thing. But I recently, I think, was able to give the exact description of how you're supposed to understand this in terms of dynamical systems. So I won't go into that. I just wanted to point out to you that the square root cancellation here for this function that's defined so simply is the Riemann hypothesis. No more, no less. So prove th when I started out by saying that proving the randomness is often the beef, <laughs> this is it. You prove that this has got square root cancellation and you've, you'll have uh, beaten a lot of people. So this is a way of stating it. It's not a way to actually exploit it. What's the exact connection here? I just want to give you one more example. Uh, I still have five minutes. I want to give you one more example from theory of L, zeta functions. So the Riemann zeta function is that series. I said this was equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. The reason is rather simple. If you take one over the Riemann zeta function, and it's not so obvious why this series is true, but if you use Euler's formula that the sum is equal to a product and then invert it, then you'll see this formula immediately. <coughs> And of course, uh, the cancellation in mu of n is going to reflect the poles now of 1 over zeta, which are the zeros of zeta. So now that I have mentioned the zeros of zeta, let me tell you uh, one thing that many of you know, but I'd like to repeat the story simply because in terms of randomness, this I think is probably the one of the most interesting, and it happened in the tea room over there many years ago, as I'll remind you very quickly. Otherwise, I don't think we would even know if it wasn't for a chance meeting in that in this kind of environment, I don't think humans would have got to this point, actually. Suppose you look at the zeros. So the zeros are supposed to be on the half line. So you write them as a half plus i times gamma j. And there have been many numerical computations, starting with people like Riemann himself. <laughs> uh, Riemann knew that the number of zeros, so of course I'm going to assume all the zeros are on the line a half because I'm, going to report, I'm reporting on a numerical experiment. That's what I'm telling you. And had a zero been off the line, you would have heard about it. <laughs> so they're all on the line, and it turns out that the number of zeros that are at about high t, between t and t plus 1, is roughly log t, this Riemann nu. So the zeros are bunching together. So if you want to somehow study the local statistics of the zeros to see, is God making these zeros randomly? Are they like random numbers? Why are they so complicated to understand? Or are they made according to some other interesting law? Well. You unfold, this is a standard thing, you just make this mean spacing one by making the numbers have mean difference one on average. You take a bunch of numbers, or let's go took here the 10 to the 20th zero, and it's 70 million neighbors, and he looked at these numbers. And he looked at, say, the consecutive spacings between them. And this is the distribution he got. And that is very far from random numbers, because if I actually took random numbers on a circle and just threw them down at random, throwing dots, there would, there would be very near degeneracies, very much like you saw with the random points on the sphere. There were holes and there were clusters. These repel each other, and this particular solid curve happens to be a pain lave 5 from completely integrable systems, and that's because this distribution that it's following happens to be the eigenvalues of a random matrix uh, w for which people can compute the answers in what's called the GUE ensemble. This is quite remarkable, and uh, what I was saying a little earlier was the only reason that I think this connection was made was uh, I think Hugh Montgomery was giving a lecture here to three people, Selberg, I think Bombieri, and one other guy turned up where he was computing something about the zeros and he got some funny answer and he didn't know how to interpret it. He ran into Freeman Dyson in the tea room and Freeman Dyson said to him, uh, what were you lecturing on? And he said this uh, pair correlation he was trying to compute for the zeros. And Dyson said, did you get this? And he gave him the answer. And he said, how did you know? He said, that's what it is for random GUE matrices. That's what I would have expected. <laughs> <laughs> It's checked out so well that if you want to generate random 
eigenvalues of a matrix, you go to Odlitsko's list of these zeros and you use them like they do in statistical tables. That fit is so good uh, that uh, there's, uh, for the physicists who were actually developing this for other reasons, nothing ever fitted that well. <laughs> and they never actually knew what this curve was exactly. Some strange Fredholm determinant or pain love A5, as I said. But let's go actually had to develop code to draw it so because these results were so accurate. All right, so I will end. So there are millions of such examples, but now let me bring the big thing. Automorphic forms. What's random about them? And I claim they violate everything, and that's why they are so juicy, and that's why they are so precious, and that's why they are a gold mine. In my opinion, we could argue this. I would like someone here, especially this year, to write a paper called The Unreasonable Effectness, Effectiveness in Number Theory of Automorphic Forms. Why is it so powerful? We have to answer that question. I mean, it's not that it's better than any other math. Let's be clear, it's not. But it does seem to carry deep information. And my view on that is that it's both, it's not, if you can write something explicitly, you'll learn a lot, but you'll never see anything complicated. And the thing about automorphic forms is they are quite complicated. In fact, a lot of the theorems that are proved are proving that two things are equal without ever identifying either side. So we are dealing with automorphic forms whose coefficients are extremely in, uh, complicated and hard to predict or write down. Yet that's very structured. And the reason we can go so far is one can compute, this is my line, to the better end. You can compute traces. This is the power of the trace formula. You can compute orbital integrals and you can just compute and people are computing with thousands and thousands of pages. And this, in a way, other than technical difficulties and many lemmas, like fundamental lemmas that get in the way, in principle, you can compute, which is quite remarkable. And the things you're computing are sufficiently complicated to carry great information in Diophantine equations where things, even the exponent, may vary. So the automorphic forms I find to be, I think, are a violation of this principle because they're not really random. They're structured, but they're sufficiently complicated to give you great information. But there is something random about it, and let me show you one thing here. You'll see a nice mixture of low-tech and high-tech. I colored that in myself. <laughs> but then I have a scanner, so I scanned it, and so I could look quite high-tech, but I spent, I actually enjoyed it. I forgot how pleasurable it is to color. <laughs> this is a automorphic form on the full modular group. It's an eigenfunction. It's a mice form. They're much more interesting for those people who, in this special year, don't seem to know this. Uh, they don't correspond to a Galois representation. And here is one that Hedgehog gave us about 20 years ago, and I've always wanted to say something about this. And this was on Selberg's wall, even. Uh, those are the zero sets. It's a zero set of this mass form. It's a real valued function of, with a large eigenvalue, and this is its nodal domain. And that's what it looks like, and I've colored in the, the ovals, the connected components. Can you say anything? Uh, it looked always too hard to say anything. Can you count the number of connected components here? So what's the random model this is supposed to be following? We know. No. And this model is probabilistically so hard that no, the probabilists can't handle it. So it's getting even more interesting. So before, when we needed random matrix theory, it was there. Meta and uh, Gordon had done what you needed there, essentially. Here, the theory that's connected to this is percolation theory much of which is far from proof. So if you want to ask for a modular form how many nodal domains it has, the answer probably lies in SLE 6. Okay, so I'm inviting in discussion. Uh, the model that I have in mind here, which seems to be checking out nicely, is that this looks like a ra random plane curve, a random real plane algebraic curve of degree square root lambda. So. Mankind, has, has anybody asked the question, if you draw, draw an elliptic curve, you draw two components in the real plane. If you draw a curve of degree 100, homogeneous polynomial in three variables, projective curve equals zero of degree 100, and you choose at random, we have to define what that means. How many ovals will it have? People have thought a lot about ovals. This is Hilbert 60, the problem about the maximum number of ovals. Will it have a maximum number? Will it have some fraction of it? 
And these are questions that I think nobody's asked before because they are they're very hard to answer probabilistically. I'll stop here, but the, the answer seems, according to everything I'm understanding at this point and what some predictions of Bogomolny, seem to be very much dependent on, uh, on a certain percolation model which predicts certain answers which actually agree with this Hecker eigenform. So it's a remarkable fact that if you take a random curve or you take a Hecker curve, the Hecker curve, the Hecker eigenfunction wants to behave like the random. And in this case, the, the probability theory is that much more difficult that uh, it's not understood at all. Though there's a lot of physics literature on this. I think I'll stop there. That's my 20 minutes. <laughs> Here's a random polynomial of degree 40 computed by Barnett. And, that's, uh, and it has a certain number of ovals. And uh, this model seems to predict that the number of ovals is a fixed fraction times the Harnack upper bound, which is for a, a curve of degree n, has at most n into n plus 1 over 2 ovals. That's Harnack's theorem, and he showed every integer in between is achieved. And then Hilbert uh, tried to see the configurations which achieve the maximum number, and he couldn't understand degree 6, and he made this Hilbert 16th problem. And there have been a lot of works. Arnold did a lot of great works on it. Uh, but they didn't ask the question of just choose it at random. Now, I emphasize here random. There's a lot of confusion of what random means here, and we could discuss it. Yeah, that was supposed to invite discussion, I hope, but yeah. <laughs> I said a lot of things that are uh, maybe a little off the wall. Who what? Who <laughs> uh, this one. <laughs> yeah, it's much better than mine, huh? <laughs> now, Barnett, and, uh, Barnett, but he got his computer to do it. I did this by hand because Hedgehog didn't color it, and I wanted to count how many ovals there were. So. I, how many c components there were. So I was uh, started out and I couldn't tell whether, which you can see the components. You can see why this is a very hard probability question because it's not a local question. You can't tell what's going on by just looking locally. This thing may come back and connect over here. And any probability question which is uh, not Markovian where you actually have to remember the past or remember what you're doing like non-intersecting self-random walks is by and large unsolved. But that doesn't stop people predicting answers. And quite incredibly, Bogomolny's prediction, uh, uh, the modular form seems to know about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, so in this mo case. OK, so of course, r random could be a point, and then <laughs> it's a measure, right? So <laughs> So the issue is, what's a natural measure on the s space of objects that you're looking at? So most of the cases where answers are known, like this GUE, let me tell you what GUE is, Gaussian Unitary Ensemble. You look at all n by n Hermitian matrices. So it's very confusing. Firstly, don't listen to anybody in that bu building over there who will tell you, or maybe Wes Dyson in that building. <laughs> You'll t uh, there's a big statement there are three ensembles, GUE, GOE, and GSE. They're actually ten. They correspond exactly to Cartan's families of irreducible sub um, um, Riemannian symmetric spaces. That's really what these are. So they are what the group stands for, what the GUE, the unitary, yeah, stands for the group you divide by when you make G mod K in a symmetric space. So in that case, you, the actual set, you look at Hermitian matrices, n by n Hermitian matrices. You make the entries, as it turns out, if you make them Gaussian with mean zero, and you make top half, you choose at random, then the bottom is determined because it's, right, you have half the parameters. And then you, uh, if you take this measure, it'll be invariant. If you take this Gaussian in the entries, it's a computation now that if you just take that as your, so Gaussian means e to the, uh, didn't tell you, it's e to the minus trace of a a star. That's the Gaussian. And that is unitary invariant. And then you compute your answer for this n by n, what's typical there. Eh? 
So if you choose according to that probability distribution, you ask how its eigenvalues look locally. Th this is not an easy thing to do. This, this has been done. This is what Gordon invented, how to compute the, the uh, distribution of local spacings. You take the limit as n goes to infinity, everything concentrates around the mean, and so you get a universal answer. So that's for matrices. For polynomials, it's much, much trickier. Because what you urged, what you, I think, would like to do is you would like to take your homogeneous polynomial and take the coefficients at random. If you do that, you'll get very few ovals. So if you take a polynomial in one variable, it's because you're not using the right symmetry of the space. You should work projectively, I'll tell you in a sec now, but suppose you took a polynomial A0 plus A1 times X plus AN times X to the N with real coefficients, and you ask, how many real zeros does it have? That would be the one-dimensional lower question. So this is an old problem that Katz, Mark Katz studied, and it has uh, only log N zeros, real zeros. So then they try to change how you choose the coefficients. Maybe you weight them in the middle and they could make more zeros. But the correct thing to do is to look at the polynomials in two variables, homogeneous, and then define your Gaussian variable by using this, the projective line with its Fabini real Fabini study metric as an inner product. So to, to define a Gaussian is to give an inner product in the vector space. And you define the inner product as the integral over the projective space relative to the volume form of the Fabini study, and then one x, x squared are not orthogonal. So the, the inner product is given by special functions, and then it turns out that you'll have n over root three zeros, completely robust. So in that notion of random, if I choose a polynomial like that with real coefficients, it'll have n over root three with very little variance. You go up one dimension, you do something similar, any dimension, and we don't know the answer. That's because in one di what you can compute is you can compute the expected length of this curve <laughs> in the Fabini study metric. But that's local, because the length you, you don't. But the minute you ask about the topology, which I know other people are interested in, then it's the only seems very difficult. There are some recent breakthroughs. We had a visitor a few months ago, Soden, who's done something rather interesting on this. So uh, now if you take other things, uh, random matrices, so I think with the zeros of zeta, I think you would have had to have big insight to think that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are spectral in nature. That has been suggested as a means to prove Riemann. I don't think that's uh, promising at all. but. Uh, it, there's no question that th they are spectral in nature. And in the function field, uh, Katz and I explained where this is coming from. There, there are, they, they, the zeros are eigenvalues of Frobenius, so there, there is a spectrum somewhere, <laughs> so it makes sense. And in fact, we use the techniques of physicists of scaling limits of monodromy to compute these kind of objects. But uh, Peter, is there a simple argument that shows why it has to be, why it should be unitary Okay, so that's, that's uh, a good question. Um, turns out that there are 10 ensembles, not three. This was a misunderstanding. Uh, it was later discovered also, or maybe simultaneously, by a physicist, Theron Bauer, that there are 10 ensembles. Uh, they come up in physics, actually. I understand they're quite popular now. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at these 10 ensembles, these 10 families of symmetric spaces, if you look at the eigenvalues, away in the bulk, what we call in the bulk. So firstly, you look at a unitary model of this. So, the, so in the Gaussian, you make everything unit. The, the mother group is UN, so that you don't have to look at infinities. So you make everything compact locally. The statistics are shown to be the same. So in this case, uh, if you keep away from the eigenvalue 1 and the eigenvalue minus 1 in these ensembles, and you go in the bulk, there actually all 10 collapse to 3. And it's not to do with GUE. It's just these three common answers out of why, the 10. Why, why, why is Riemann zeta related to unitary as opposed to orthogonal? Or OK, so if you took uh, automorphic form uh, of a certain type, 
and you took a family associated with that, you would get uh, orthogonal or symplectic. So the, the way I understand it is you take the L function whose zeros you're interested in, uh, or family, and you look, so high up, let me step back a second. For a given L function, if you move up on the high zeros, there's only one answer from this universality that I just explained to you. That is, in the bulk, there are only three, and in number theory, there's only one that remains. So Katz and I were totally confused for a very long time because we were working with curves, which have a symplectic structure, and we kept on expecting to find GSE, symplectic, because the word symplectic was in their answer. <laughs> we were working in this naive way. Then we realized that in what we were looking at, we had four families. Not all ten come up in number theory, as far as we can see. So not everything that we know comes up in L functions. Of the ones we found, uh, the four that came up naturally through monodromy, in the bulk, which is the analog of high zeros, there was only one answer. So it shouldn't be called GUE. It's just that universal answer, which zeta and every L function has. But if you take a family of L functions and you look at zeros near a half or near the birch and dyer point with a lot of interest, then the answer uh, fits into these four families that we have. And numerically, everything has been verified. Theoretically, a lot of this is now understood. So, but why it's following that, we don't have, I mean, I can give you a spectral interpretation of the zeros, which may be saying why it's happening, but it's not a particularly useful one in that it hasn't allowed us to put the zeros on the line. So they are spectral in nature, but the, to be useful, you need to find a spectral interpretation which is, can be worked with. And that's what, of course, uh, growth and Dix machinery gives you in, say, in the proof, uh, or Bayes' proof. In, in the case of curves, it's something a little more special. Um, but in the more general proof of Deleon, you use families, and these symmetry types play a very big role. Um, so there's no question. It's clear that there's only one answer, high up. So, and that's a misnomer that it should be called unitary, in my opinion. And we try to make this point in our book. Yeah? Um, so sometimes the lack of systems can yes, look uh, randomly. Is well, there's a fantastic book. Is there between that seeming randomness and the presence yeah. of Yeah. Okay, firstly, there's a lovely, well, to me, one of the most beautiful books of the Vile Lectures was... Uh, Jorgen Moses lecture. Stabes, I think it's called Stable and Randomness in, in Mechanics. Or less than whatever. Sta stable and Random Motions in Mechanics. I think that's what it's called. We explains that even if you look at the five-body problem or something like this, you can have islands of, of course, uh, KM islands of structure, and then you have chaotic behavior in between. Um, that... So dynamics, so if you make a symplectic map or you do some kind of dynamics uh, and you make it number theoretically, so maybe you make a transformation of a torus which is uh, in SP2GZ, a torus, and you iterate this torus and you look at the orbits. So the orbits will behave chaotically in a way that uh, you understand for generic points. But what's kind of interesting is if you quantize that, there's a way of quantizing. This is why I was asking <laughs> what you meant by quantizing. <laughs> you can quantize a symplectic map. It's not unique. But you get some action on a Hilbert space. And then you can look at the eigenvalues there. And there's some very nice uh, conjectures of probably Berry, Bogomolny, people like that, relating the classical dynamics to the randomness of the spectrum, for instance. And it's a dichotomy uh, if the system happens to be purely chaotic or purely integrable. But if the system has got classically a mixture of behaviors, then... So I stick my neck out. I say the only interesting problems on the... When I said a dichotomy, I say it's either structured or it's random. And I've, anything I've looked at seems to... Once you don't know the answer, then it's just random. But automorphic forms are the country. And I think... Well, let me point out the uh, irony of that. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 that is a remarkable fact that this curve, yeah, this is a remarkable fact that actually you know who we owe that to. We owe that to Elliot Lieb. Let me explain why. 
So this curve here, which if you look in Gordon's early work and in Mater's book, where this curve is given as a Fredholm determinant on an interval, and it's a beautiful application of Fredholm theory, to get this curve as some function of s. So, and then it's drawn. This is how it looks. Go, did it? Uh, Cyto, so you mentioned integrable systems. Saito, Miwa, Jimbo, ooh, some other guy. <laughs> one, uh, there's a four-man four paper. Four, well, one of them is a woman, I think. Uh, uh, showed that certain tau functions connected with uh, monodromy, uh, with isomonodromy, are completely integrable. And they came and uh, were lecturing here, or explaining it here. And uh, it was, I think, Elliot Lieber pointed out that this determinant that comes from uh, Gordon's work happens to be a tau function. So it turns out that that equation satisfies a nonlinear ODE. <laughs> I said, I think it's a pain love A5, if I remember correctly. Uh, I, I, so, I, you know, that's, uh, so that's a purely probabilistic <laughs> statement. That's a fact about the distribution in this probabilistic model of the local spacing between the eigenvalues. It happens to be governed by a completely integrable system but I think that's uh, just the answer. I, d I wouldn't read too much into that. It's like, uh, I mean, it's like saying e to the minus x squared. If you're doing probability, everything is Gaussian. Well, anything interesting is not really Gaussian, as you see. But anything is Gaussian. You don't read too much into the function e to the minus x squared because it comes up everywhere. I guess there are some arguments of Berezan, if I remember, which try to give you some universality of certain systems which lead to this function automatically. That's true. And if you look at the Tao and Vu recent paper and uh, following uh, H.T. Yao and uh, Schlein and Co., proving universality for more general matrices, not just ones which satisfy these symmetries I was telling you about a moment ago, uh, those proofs, uh, they don't tell you the answer you want. They just show that everything has this one behavior but they don't have any other way of computing that behavior other than to go back to Gordon or some supersymmetric method that you know. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know how to read into that too much. The answer is what it is. And it could be misleading, yes. Maybe, maybe the zeros of zeta are following something else, which happens to be the same. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure it's because they're spectral. At least the function field, that's what's the source. So th th there's no question that the zeros are eigenvalues of something interesting, and we haven't found that. Uh, I thought that people were going to come to the board. <laughs> 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 okay.